Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope of no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He canceled my debt And he called me his friend When death was arrested And my life began Oh, your grace so free Washes over Rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested and my life began
Welcome, everyone. I'm going to ask you to please uh, stand up so we can read our call to worship. How many are excited to be back in church? Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. We're going to be reading out of Romans 8, 14 through 17. The Word of God says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself t testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share his suffering in order, we also share in his glory. Amen.
Father, we are so grateful that even though the enemy tries to keep your children down in this world, God, you lift us right back up. You abolish evil things, and you bring us back through your strength, through your joy, and give us praise to give you praise. Father, I pray that you would touch each and every person here, Father God, at the sound of your word, God. Your word says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I pray right now, Father God, touch our pastors, the message, God, that it will invade the very place of their hearts where fear 
wants to reside and take over. And we bind that spirit of fear. We bind every lie from the enemy, from the pit of hell. Because your word says, Father God, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, we shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. So, Father, touch each and every heart. I pray peace, joy. I pray resurrection power over your church and over everyone, Father God, today. Have your way, Lord. Bless each and every person. Bless our pastors for their faithful service, God, and everyone who has been their armor bearers in prayer, in service, and in everything these past 14 faithful years that they have given you, Lord. Bless them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. possible let's give them a hand uh, I mean the, I meant the worship team I meant the worship team although the pastors worked on it a little bit I guess but uh, the worship team and the and the ushers hey what's that big truck doing in front of your house well we loaded up all our stuff and we were moving the ushers were there they were ushering everything into this big truck. You know, I thought clergy took a vow of poverty. You got a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, isn't that true? When you're moving, you always find out you have way too much stuff. You're moving? Yeah, we're moving to Idaho. How come I'm the last to know? Are Rat and I going with you? Yeah, you're going with you. wouldn't leave you behind. Believe me, I thought about leaving you behind. <laughs> you're a smart aleck. Yeah, I am. I thought about leaving you behind, but I thought, no, I better take you along. You get lonely in that bag. Yeah, I get lonely in my bag. Rat, do you hear that? We're going with. Good, good, good. Goody, goody. Why goody? Because... I get to explore new dumpsters over in Post Falls. Do they have dumpsters in Post Falls? I suppose they do, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, we're all going to go together, and you don't have to worry about that. Hey, I'm going to miss all my friends. Yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? We're going to miss all of our friends. And uh, that's really sad, isn't it? Yeah, that's sad. You know what? I had an idea. What was that? My idea was that maybe when you look at it from God's point of view, it's not so long that we'll be apart. I mean, you could die tomorrow. Everybody here could die. This church could burn down, and we'd all be to heaven together and never have to be apart. I don't like that idea very much. But you know, it is true. When we get to heaven, this time that we spend on earth is just going to be like that. And the good, great thing about being a Christian is that forever and ever and ever and ever you can be with your friends in heaven. And even though sometimes we have to leave our friends for a while down here, because we all know Jesus and we're going to go to heaven, we'll be able to be together forever and ever in heaven. And even when someone dies, like Avina Jones recently passed away, we know we're going to see her again. Yeah, I look forward to seeing Avina. But there's only one thing I don't look forward to. And what's that? With Avina. Oh, really? Now you be careful what you say 
We're not supposed to say anything bad about people passing away because you never know. They might be able to hear what we're saying up in heaven. Well, imagine, let's say that it's 10 more years before you die or 20 or 30. Imagine how many jokes she'll have by then. We'll be listening to jokes for a year from Avena when we get to heaven. Yeah, that's right. But you know what? We'll have a year. We can listen to jokes. We can do all kinds of stuff when we're in heaven. I'm looking forward to heaven. Rats only live two years, so I'm going to be there within the year. You're looking forward to it? Yeah. Imagine the Bible describes heaven as a huge feast. They're going to need some rats up there. Yeah, they probably will, but I'm not sure rat... Well, I better not say that. Okay, yeah, you accepted Jesus, so you'll probably... Yeah, you're probably right. There's a lot of rats up in heaven, okay? (laughs) All right, kids. Kids, don't worry. You might miss me for a while, but maybe I'll become a big star, and I'll be online, and you can see me in the future, and even we could all be together forever in heaven, ever in heaven. Yeah, that's a good thought. Let's hold on to that, okay? Bye-bye. God bless. So, yeah, I want to thank the ushers for coming over yesterday and helping us load the truck. And uh, we didn't want a lot of help on that because I was in the truck trying to stack everything up to the ceiling. And if you get too much help, it's kind of hard. But we had just enough help. And uh, we got it all loaded and we got everything taken uh, care of. And uh, people have been asking me about the new pastor. And just this last, about a week, this past week, maybe a week ago or so, the superintendent sent out an email to the board uh, of administration here and said that there was a pastor and wife that they're recommending for him. They're both ordained, the pastor and his wife. And so they'll be having meetings and looking at that, but they have a number one candidate that they want to send here. If that doesn't work, they'll go down the list to others. But I don't know who it is, and in our system, I don't necessarily have, uh, I'm not involved in that whole decision. What happens is um, uh, I give my ideas, and the board gives their ideas of the type of pastor we think that we would like, and then the, uh, the committee and the conference ministerial appointments committee decides then, uh, looking at all the resumes and people applying, uh, who's going to fit that criteria. Now, until that time, we have two pastors still here. We have Pastor Sabino and Pastor David. And if you have needs, uh, you can contact them or prayer requests. You can go through them and they'll uh, take care of the church. Probably the new pastor's not going to get here till January. At least that's what I heard. The board of administration members, uh, board members, will have more up-to-date information about that. We're leaving tomorrow sometime, whenever the people come to pick up our truck. But I, uh, I've been um, preaching through Ephesians, and I finished that up. And then the last two weeks, I've been preaching from the first eight chapters of Romans. And... Uh, I recently taught a Wesleyan theology class with the ministerial candidates, and uh, I was looking in Romans and realizing that the five different types of grace that John Wesley talks about in our lives are all featured in the first eight uh, chapters of Romans. So last week, I went through the first three, and... uh, First, the first one is in Romans chapter 1, Awakening Grace, where Paul talks about how everybody has a conscience and they can see God in nature. And uh, when people do that, they start awakening and start asking questions about God. That's the Holy Spirit actually speaking to people. Now, I know some people say that the uh, Holy Spirit doesn't speak to people who aren't Christians. They're wrong. He speaks to them all the time. I mean, how are you going to be a, a Christian unless God draws you to himself. So that's awakening grace. Or sometimes in theological circles, it's called prevenient grace for preventing us from from our ears from getting so stopped up that we can't hear God's voice in our conscience. So that's the first type of grace where God comes and takes the initiative to come into our lives. The second kind is called convicting or sometimes convincing grace. That's when you come under conviction of sin. And the law of God is written, Paul says, uh, in in the book of um, Romans, it's written on our conscience. 
but also God has given his law, his laws, in the Bible through revelation. He's revealed himself in history and given us laws. Of course, the law of Moses, law of faith, which was way back 4,000 years ago with Abraham. Law of Moses was about 3,000 years ago. And then, of course, the New Testament is probably around 2,000 years ago. So we have this ancient book that uh, spans a lot of recorded history that has the laws of God. So people uh, have the law of God, and then when they seek to obey the law of God and obey their conscience, they find out that they can't, and they come under conviction. That's what the first few chapters of Romans are about. And uh, Paul says that God didn't just make a bunch of rules just to make us feel guilty. He provided a way to save us. But we have to admit that we can't do it on our own. We have to reach out to God's love and mercy. And that's the third kind of grace. It's called saving grace. Or justification is the theological term. So I talked about that last week. You can watch the message if you want to. Today I want to finish up with the other two kinds of grace. Sanctifying grace and glorifying grace. God's grace is the Holy Spirit speaking and reaching out to us. Now I want to talk about sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is one of the, uh, is the type of grace that the Wesleyan movement, the holiness movement, really focused a lot on. on. Sanctifying grace. There's lots of different words for it. And what sanctifying grace is, it's God coming in and cleansing our lives and working in our lives and empowering us and uh, teaching us and increasing our love so that we become more and more like Jesus Christ, where we can love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. Sanctifying grace. Now, there's different words in the Bible used for it. And it's really interesting because I woke up early this morning, about 6 a.m., and I had an idea that I'd never had before. It wasn't to go to the bathroom. (laughs) I've had that one before. Although I did go to the bathroom. Okay, you've got too much information already, right? (laughs) The idea I had was, and I've been involved in different churches in my life, and they all teach a type of sanctifying grace, sometimes called the second work of grace. After you become a Christian, you're going to go through a crisis where you're not living up to the standard that, that, that your conscience and that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, and you finally get so frustrated that you just say, okay, God, take all of me. And then there are some things that God does in our life that makes just as much of a difference in our life as justification or when we were saved. A second work of God's grace. And uh, all the different types of traditions in in, um, our church talk about this sanctifying grace. And that's the idea that I had. I realized that they all focus on different aspects of it. Okay? So... um, when I was in an independent Baptist church, they're not a holiness church, they're not a Wesleyan type church, and so they don't talk a lot about sanctification. The holiness and Wesleyan churches talk about it a lot, okay? Because that's kind of our emphasis in the whole body of Christ. But when I was in the independent Baptist church, and I was 13 years old, I came forward and I was sanctified. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a Baptist church, it doesn't, supposedly doesn't even believe in it. But what they were preaching on that day was making Jesus Lord of your life. Because the Calvinistic type churches, the Baptist and covenant churches, they focus on the fact that God is sovereign. And so when they talk about sanctification, they talk about making Jesus Lord of your life. And the Bible talks about that a lot. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? It means moving over in the driver's seat and letting Jesus control your life totally, completely, giving yourself completely to him. That's sanctification. I came forward when I was 13 years old. I knelt at the altar and they prayed with me and I was sanctified. I detected or, or, or noticed I can understand scripture better, and I had a tremendous love put in my heart for everybody, even the people at church, at school that were being mean to me. Sanctification, the second word, grace. 
in a Baptist church that supposedly doesn't believe in it. Okay? Now, other groups have different names for it. Sanctification or holiness is a very common feature in the Roman Catholic Church. They're always trying to... Sanctification means to cleanse and make something so that it can be used by God. Like taking a, a, a glass and cleaning it so that you can use it for company. That's sanctification. In the Catholic Church, what are they doing? They're always, you're always going to the different types of uh, confession and mass and all the different services. And what's the point of all those? It's to purify you and forgive you and help you to become holy. So, this, for, so the Catholic Church talks about holiness and sanctification, but the way that they stress is a continual confession. Okay? So it's in the Catholic Church too, but, it's, but they talk about being holy or pure or sanctified, okay? Now, what about the Pentecostals? They talk about being filled with the Spirit, don't they? Yeah. And what happens when you're filled with the Spirit? You're empowered to live for Jesus. And what are the signs of being filled with the Spirit? It's the gifts of the Spirit, right? And if you're Pentecostal, you think that everybody has a gift of tongues. We don't necessarily believe that. We believe that everybody has different gifts, but we don't all have the gift of tongues. We have different gifts. But, they, but there too, that's sanctification, the filling with the Spirit. They stress the empowerment of God. And then there's the Methodists, John Wesley. John Wesley was misunderstood because he talked about Christian perfection. And people thought that when he talked about Christian perfection that he meant that you're absolutely perfect, you never make a mistake, you never sin. Well, he said you can keep from sinning, but the likelihood of you going your whole life without sinning is almost zero. You're going to have to ask for forgiveness sometime. But you can be given power not to be enslaved by sin. We sang about that. You're free. You're no longer a slave. You choose to be a servant of righteousness, but you are no longer a slave of that old life. And Paul talks about that in the book of Romans. He said, consider that old life that you're dead to that and you have a new life. So he talked about Christian perfection, but when you study the Bible and you study this word perfect, the, the word is teleos in the Greek. And what it means is, and some of your Bibles are going to translate it mature, and others are going to translate it perfect. It's kind of somewhere between perfect and mature, okay? Perfect means that you've arrived at the end, that you're complete, that it's done. Like when a new car rolls off the assembly line, it's perfect, it's done, it's complete. Mature means that it has reached a stage where it produces fruit. So he talked about Christian perfection, but that wasn't his favorite word for um, this holiness, this sanctification, this being filled with the Spirit, this second work of grace. His favorite word was perfect love. To love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. He talked about perfect love, and that's what he stressed. And, of course, that comes out of the Bible, too, out of the Apostle John. So, whereas the Pentecostals typically will stress the gifts of the Spirit, the holiness churches, which believe in the gifts of the Spirit, will stress the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. So, here we have it. We have all the different traditions, and they all have sanctification, they all have holiness, and they all stress a different aspect of it. So what is this sanctification? What is this holiness? What is this second work of grace? It is making Jesus Lord of your life, like the Baptists say. It's being filled with the power of the Spirit, like the Pentecostals say. It's being, have, it's, it's being mature in the Lord and bearing fruit, like the Wesleyans say. It's continually cleansing yourself, being humble and asking forgiveness and being aware of your own imperfections before the Lord, like the Catholics say. 
We don't have to go to a priest. We can pray directly as Protestants, right? That's how we look at it. And it is being filled, overflowing with the love of God. That's holiness. And that's our church. That's the Free Methodist Church. We're a holiness church. And we typically stress the cleansing aspect and the love aspect, but it's all the above. All of that. So, when we're saved, we believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sin, we give our lives to him, and we invite him into our life. Okay? There's a verse in the Bible that talks about that. I'm now at the Revelation 3.20. I might have got off there a little bit. <laughs> and she's trying to follow me. Becky, you do a great job. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. That's Jesus knocking on the door. <clears throat> when you accept Jesus into your life, he forgives all your sin. You accept his sacrifice on the cross for you comes into your life. That's the Holy Spirit. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And it's like you're eating with Jesus. And I kind of look at it this way. Probably when I maybe would ever, and I don't do it very often, I've learned better than to do this, but let's say I invite someone over for lunch and I don't tell Jean. And they come and she hasn't cleaned up the house. And we're eating and all of a sudden, I'm looking around, and I'm going, oh, my, this house is a mess. Well, when we first invite Jesus in, that's how it is, isn't it? We didn't realize it was that messy, or maybe we would have never even invited him in. We knew we needed Jesus. We opened the door to him. But it seems like things didn't get better. It looks like things are worse. At least we're more aware of it now. And then Jesus says, okay, when we're done eating and fellowshiping for a while, I'm going to help you clean up your house. Okay? Just like uh, Jane came over and helped Jean yesterday clean up our house while we, were, while we were moving, and the guys helped me move all our stuff. Some of the guys did. I'll help you clean up your house. <clears throat> and then you go, okay, well, you can clean in the living room, Jesus, and you can clean in the kitchen. But I've got a room over here. I'm not sure I want you to clean over here. So yeah, you accepted Jesus. You want forgiveness of sins, justification, but you're not sure you want to give all of everything to Jesus. But there comes, he said, I'm going to clean that on my own. I'll clean that, don't worry. And when I get it clean, then you can come in and you can give it the white glove treatment, okay? Jesus says, doesn't work that way. You can't clean it on your own. Just like you couldn't invite me in and be forgiven on your own, you can't clean it on your own. I have to come in and help you. And you're going to have to open every room of the house. If there's a door that's locked, you're going to have to give me the key. To no, not ready for that yet. And then finally you come to a place where it said, I've been cleaning, cleaning, and I just get it dirty, and then it's messed up again. I need your help. I give you the key. I'm opening my whole life up to you. Second work of grace, entire sanctification. I've got areas of my life where I'm not as loving as I should be. Yeah, outwardly everybody thinks, hey, you're a great person, you're always doing everything great, and you got no problems, you're almost like a perfect person. But inwardly I know that I'm not as loving as I need to be. Whatever it is, open up completely. You consecrate yourself to God, he comes in and fills you with his spirit. Second work of grace. The Apostle Paul talks about that crisis experience in Romans chapter 7, verses 16 through 19. And when you read through the first eight chapters of Romans, some people think that this is what they're talking about, that all the Christians have to struggle like this their whole life. They think this is normative. But if you read the whole eight chapters, you realize that Paul is going through a progression of grace and a progression of growth for Christians. And this is the crisis point where we realize we can't do it on our own. And I'm going to read, um, I could read so much scripture, but I'm just going to read Romans chapter 7, verses 16 through 19. 
He says, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. That's the law of conscience, the law of God, the Bible. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to, that I do. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? So Paul is going through the Christian life and saying, you come to a crisis point where you say, yeah, I'm a Christian. I know I'm a Christian, but I'm still really struggling with some things. I seem to have this evil, carnal inclination inside of myself that I just can't deal with. And so we come under that conviction and we go through that struggle. We have an inclination towards sin. It's called in theology original sin. When will we be delivered? Do we have to wait until we die to be delivered from that? The message of holiness, the message of the free Methodist church, the message of, of, of the Bible is no, we don't have to be, die. John Wesley said the inclination or the tendency or bent towards sinning can be turned toward, to a bent towards righteousness, victory. There comes a time when you're tired of the struggle. Where's the rest of the story? I'm going to read verses, chapter 7, verses 25 through 8, verse 4. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let me translate a little bit about that. You can meditate on it and you can get all the points in there, but basically what Paul is saying is that this war doesn't have to continue. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die just to cover up your sin. He didn't die just to, to, for justification. He died to cleanse you in your heart and in your life and to give you power over sin, not in yourself, but through the grace and opening up and allowing God's spirit to continually work in your life. That's entire sanctification when you do that, when you open up and do that. So there's another law, a law of the Spirit, he says, that's stronger than the law of condemnation of sin and death. Carnality, the flesh, is overcome by the power of the Spirit in our lives. We're no longer carnal, but spiritual when we've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Sin leads to death. It started out in the garden. And continued sin leads to death. But there's a law of life and a law of the Spirit. And it's by the Spirit's power that we live. I think a sermon is inadequate to explain this. Some of you may want to study this and look into it a little bit more. But there might be some people in your life today that you're ready to hear this message. You're at that crisis point. And, and the Holy Spirit's prepared you to hear this message. So I want to tell you pretty simply, how do you do that? How do you experience that second work of grace? You don't have to kneel at an altar, but you have to make in your heart an altar. And here's what you need. Number one, confess your need of this filling. Lord, I can't clean up my house by myself. I need you. I want to give myself totally to you. I don't want to struggle with this area of my life. I want to give that area totally to you. I admit I can't do it. Confess your need. Ask God to fill you completely every area of your life. I present myself completely and totally to you, God. And just like you believed in Jesus for your salvation, 
to save you, to forgive your sin, believe that he will. Then thank him. And lastly, wait on the witness of the Spirit. What's that? You might not feel differently when you say that prayer. It might take a while before in your heart you know that God has done that work. In fact, you might see some like gradual changes. Or it could be huge changes. You know? Something huge that would only be a miracle that only God could do, like giving up eating ice cream. Now, I just lost most of you, okay? <laughs> no, you don't have to give up eating ice cream, but you have to give up, glut give, give up gluttony, maybe. Yeah, yeah, you do have to give up gluttony. No, it's not about the law. It's not about these things. It's about opening up your life and allowing the Holy Spirit to come. And for some of you, the, the evidence may be, the, the most common evidence of filling with the Spirit, by the way, is not the gift of tongues. If you read all of Scripture and you look at the second work of grace, you look at the filling of the Spirit, you look at sanctification, there's, there's two things that are the most common that are associated with this filling of the Spirit that's talked about in the Scripture. One is love. That's why Wesley stressed the love. Love will start multiplying and growing in your life greater than ever before. The other is witnessing. When the power of the Spirit comes upon you, you want, you'll start witnessing and telling people about the goodness of Jesus Christ. And that's what happened to me at that little Baptist church. I got a love for everybody. I wanted my friends at school to be saved. I wanted them to know God. And I started talking to them and witnessing for them. And I also got an understanding of the scripture because the Holy Spirit was helping me to understand. So there's a lot of fruit, there's a lot of uh, results of this. So I want to just take a moment and I have a little bit more sermon to do today. Uh, not a lot, like one, one and a half, one more page of my message. It's a four page message. But I think I want to take time just to bow our heads, and there, there may be some people here who are at that place where you're ready to receive this. And I want to just bow our heads and go step by step through it and pray. And if you're in your heart, you can pray. The Holy Spirit is here. And, and maybe this would be the day that you could experience this second work of God's grace in your life, this power, this cleansing, this filling with love. So I'm just going to... Uh, uh, step by step, just pray a little prayer and, and then pause and let you kind of meditate. You can pray your own prayer. It can be similar to what I'm praying. Let's bow our heads. First of all, in your own words with the Lord, confess your need of his filling. What areas of your life do you feel powerless? Do you feel a slave? Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's depression. It comes out in different ways. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe it's anger. What area of your life do you need freedom from? Confess your need. Okay, ask God to come into your life and fill you with his spirit. Every area of your life. Okay, now believe that he will by faith. Say, Lord, I believe that you will. I know you love me. And now thank him. And now ask the Lord to give you some sign, some change, something that will help you to know that he did this work in you. Lord, Give us some sign, a witness of the Spirit. Inner, outer, those two witnesses, inner and outer. 
a feeling inside that we're different and change is starting to occur. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's two witnesses of the Spirit. One is an inner witness, and the other is an outer witness. And Paul talks about these in Romans 8, 14 through 17. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. So you're not a slave. You're not dead in sin. You're alive to Christ. The Spirit is with you, and there's an inner witness that the Spirit Spirit has done something inside of you. He's with you. That's a witness of the Spirit. And the other witness is that there are actual changes that occur in your behavior and what you do and in your love of other people. There are two witnesses. In Romans 8 and the rest of the chapter, the Apostle Paul uh, talks about how even though you are a Christian you're justified in, in God, forgiven of your sins, even though you're filled with His Spirit, it doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're going to be walking on clouds the rest of your life and not having any problems. So when you're reading uh, Romans 1 through 8, you come to Romans 8, and he's talked about uh, how you become a child of God and there's a witness of God's Spirit, that he, that's the Holy Spirit is with you. And he talks about living in the Spirit, and then he talks about how hard it's going to be. I thought you said I was going to have a new inclination, a bent towards righteousness. Yes, but now the persecution comes from outside, perhaps more than ever before. And he's writing to a group of Christians in Rome where the Roman government was supremely strong and where the Roman government could tell you, I want you to worship the emperor. And so they were persecuted. And so he talks about how you're going to be sanctified, you're going to be filled with the Spirit and empowered to live for God, but it isn't going to be an easy road for you. It's going to be really difficult, and you're, the persecution may increase for you. There's still going to be sickness just because you're filled with the Spirit doesn't mean you might not, it doesn't mean that, that you wouldn't get cancer, for instance. There's sickness, there's persecution. But you have the presence of God, the powerful presence of God with you. And he talks about that presence of God is going to be with you till the very end. And even. God's grace and His presence and His Holy Spirit is going to be with you to usher you into heaven. That's glorifying grace. It's the last kind of grace that's talked about here. And so I'm going to read uh, 11 verses from Romans chapter 8. It talks about the glorifying grace, how God will be with you even through the difficult times. And I know that there's some scriptures in here that are your favorites. You've memorized even some of these scriptures because they've helped you through difficult times. But um, I want you to see the context here. We're talking about God's faithfulness to us from now until Jesus comes or until that day comes when we meet Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him who have been called according to His purpose. And then here it talks about that, that it's, it's actually talking about that whole transition of grace that I've been preaching on, just in a couple verses here. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of, of his Son. So God did not create you to be a slave of sin, 
didn't create you to go to hell. He created you to accept Jesus and to, and to follow Jesus and uh, to become like Jesus Christ. That's why we were created. God foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters and those he predestines he also called. God called you, convicted you, and brought you to him through his grace. He called you. And even today, if you have asked God to come into your life in a new way, this second work of grace, sanctification that I'm talking about, if you did that, it's because the Holy Spirit has been calling you. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Of course, the answer is no. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. So just because you're persecuted, just because you're going through hard times, doesn't mean that you're separated from God's love. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even death separates us from his love. So what do we have to fear? We don't have to fear anything. We're in God's hands. And if stuff comes our way, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He awakened us, helped us to see him in our conscience and in our nature. He convicted us of sin so that we would turn to him and and ask for his grace and mercy. He convinced us that Jesus had the answer. And we had faith. And we were forgiven of all that old sin and our old self was destroyed. That old self was left behind. We were born again. We became new people in Christ. And then he filled us with his spirit and empowered us to be able to become more like Jesus Christ He gave us gifts that we can bless other people and and honor Him. He gave us the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, self-control. He sanctified us and cleansed us, powered us to live for Him, and stayed with us through difficult times, thicker than And one day he's going to usher us into heaven and we are heirs with Jesus Christ. That's the message of the first eight chapters of Romans. It's the message of God. It's a message for us today. And it's my privilege to share the wonderful grace of God with you. Because that's what he did with me. God worked in my heart and he's still working. There's still some areas that I have to confess and and turn over to him. You know, the thought life is the hardest. Um, Paul talks about that when you have your mind set on the sinful things, you're, you're going to go that direction. But when you have your mind set on, on the spiritual things, on God, that, that God's mind will fill your mind. That's where the battle takes place. But God can give us the victory. We can be conquerors through Jesus Christ. Praise God. So that's the message that I have. My final message here. It's a message of God's grace. And God will be a place, this, this church is, is, is a place of grace. People, everybody that comes in here experiences it. May it continue to be so. God bless you.
Now, it, I'm going to say a blessing for you, and then I have, as, as I end up, I have a special little thing I want to say to you. So, first of all, Lord, may each person here experience the unfolding of grace in their lives like a blanket covering them, being with them. In the name of Jesus, amen. And I want to say one thing to you. I am so glad you got to spend some time with me. <laughs> okay, I'm working on humility, I know it. <laughs> God bless you. He's going to, dis- uh, Al's going to dismiss you, I think. Yeah, yeah. Each person. God bless you.